And this final session is, is about the, the crucial um, final strength for me, the movement building element. Um, how we go about building the collective power to actually push through the changes that we need to see, to actually deliver that debt repudiation and debt cancellation that our speakers have been talking about, claiming back those reparations for the victims of unjust and illegitimate debt, actually pushing through <coughs> rules so that lenders have, are finally held responsible um, and, and stop being exploitative, and also building those real economic alternatives um, that are about changing the, the fundamental way that our economic system works so that people and countries aren't driven into debt just to provide for their basic needs and social goods in the first place. And I think as it will become clear to everyone today, um, there's thousands of campaigners and activists around the world who are already doing absolutely amazing work to throw off these chains of illegitimate debt. Um, and in this final plenary, we're going to hear from some really inspiring campaigners and thinkers, um, both about the highlights of the campaigns that they're involved in at the moment, and also um, how they think that we can sort of collectively strengthen this movement for debt justice. Um, so our first speaker um, is one of the, the veterans of the Jubilee movement. She's one of the leaders of Jubilee 2000, which is the big movement that we grew out of as Jubilee Debt Campaign um, to mobilise people in this country in support of the campaign to cancel all the unjust developing country debt that built up in the 1970s and 1980s. In 2006, she published a book called The Coming First World Debt Crisis, um, and she's now a director of Prime, which is Policy and Research in Macroeconomics. And she's recently published another book um, called Just Money, How Society Can Break the Despotic Power of Finance. So please welcome me in welcoming Anne Pettipool. It's very inspiring just to be here and to see the faces of many who have been campaigning on this issue for so long and who are still persevering and how wonderful it is to see you all. I am... <clears throat> It's been quite an emotional week for me because uh, I was invited by the family of Tony Bent to attend his funeral at St. Margaret's <coughs> Church in Westminster, the establishment's church, where the establishment go to bury their dead. And um, it was extraordinary because it was a gathering, if you like, of all the Benites of the 1980s, all of us who struggled alongside and with Tony for transformational change. Anyway, there I was in St. Um, Margaret's Church, and of course Tony was a dis dissenter. He, he came from the Protestant tradition of Congregationalists who dissented, and he'd grown up in a, a very sort of religious household, although he himself was, he called, a lapsed Christian. <coughs> but they read out of it, they read out this verse from Corinthians, and I wanted to read this to you because I found it quite profound. I mean, you, you know it all very well, but I want to repeat it. 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Love, they wrote, they said, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For our knowledge is imperfect and our prophecy is imperfect. But when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall understand fully even as I, be, as I have been fully understood. So, faith, hope, love, abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. And I thought that was really important and profound because that was what Tony Benn was about. Mm -hmm. That was why he was so vilified, why he was so marginalised, why he was attacked and persecuted, if you like was because that was what he was about. He was about love. And what we're about when we talk about debt is not about love, but about the love of money. And we have moved from a position when in the 1970s and 80s we were fighting for the love of others, 
for the love of others, not just here, but those in other countries, for the love of those who weren't just like ourselves, for the love of others that were men and well as women, for the love of black people, for the love of gay people. These were big fights that we fought. And we were persecuted and vilified and, and ridiculed. And then we go to church in late, in late March 2014, and who's in the church? But the whole of the British establishment, revering Tony Benn. So there you go. I wanted to read that because, you know, this, this phrase about we see things dimly is how we feel when we're campaigning and when we're in the heart of a struggle. I've just spoken to a friend who said, it's been an amazing day, but I feel depressed. I just feel there's too much. It's all too much for me to handle. I, I don't know that we can tackle this big thing. Well, I tell you, we didn't know that we could tackle $100 billion of debt owed by 35 of the poorest countries when we started in 1994 on, in a shed on the roof of Christian Aid's building, which was made up of corrugated walls, and the walls didn't quite come down to the floor. So that in winter we had to put our feet up around our chairs to keep warm. We didn't think that we would mobilize millions of people, not just in this country, but in, in countries throughout the world. We never dreamt that there would be branches of Jubilee 2000 all over the world, that the IMF and the World Bank would come to be intimidated by something called Jubilee 2000. We didn't think that could happen, but it did happen. Now, the results weren't marvelous. The results weren't uh, what we weren't transformational, is what I would say. The enemy went on to make themselves even more powerful than they were when we were struggling against them. But there were results. There were some profound results. After our campaign, Nigeria's debt was written off. Brazil paid down her debt to the IMF. P countries got out from under the IMF. The IMF was in crisis. The IMF was rescued from crisis by Greece. Without Greece, the IMF staff were beginning to worry about their futures. <laughs> Argentina, we, I campaigned, we were in Argentina in 2001. Argentina nearly brought down the IMF. So what happens is, you struggle, you struggle, you, you really weaken your enemy, you weaken the IMF. <laughs> And then, then the enemy redoubles their efforts and comes at you in the form of the Eurozone crisis and strengthens themselves in that process. But that's because we're still looking through this thing dimly and we have to start looking clearly and start going face to face and, uh, and believing that it is possible to achieve transformational change, which I think it is. But there are some conditions. I've just been asked, I know I haven't got a lot of time now, but I've just been asked about what it is that we have to do, what it is that caused the crisis in the first instance, and what do we have to do to end the crisis or to transform the situation. First of all, the cause of the crisis was that, I want to, I want to say this to many of you because I know we're here, we're on the left. We had a blind spot for that intangible thing we call money and finance. We love working on this thing which is called McDonald's and trade and all that tangible stuff that you can see when you walk down the high street. That's, you know, coffee, fair trade, all of that. We can work on that because we can touch it, we can see it, we can not buy it, we can boycott it, we can deal with it. Wall Street in the city of London, very deliberately, is invisible to us. And we allow that invisibility to persevere. And we still do. I think we still don't fully understand what happened to us and what's going on. So I think there's a kind of absolute prerogative on behalf of the left to understand the finance sector, to stop the focus on the tangible, but to begin to focus on the intangible. Then there's another problem, which is the economics profession. And for me, this is almost the most powerful enemy of them all. You know, I think the Wall Street bankers and so on are, are powerful, but they are underpinned, they are supported by institutions such as this one. Institutions such as UCL, the London School of Economics, and so on, who teach in economics, which is about this part of the world, the tangible bit of the world. So money in this part, of, in their theory, is that tangible stuff that you can touch. It's coins and notes, and it's gold and silver. That's the monetarist, right-wing, orthodox understanding of money. But, but since 1694, 
Money has been this intangible thing. Banks have been creating money out of thin air since before 1694. In 1694, they involved the state in the process with the founding of the Bank of England. But that understanding of the nature of money, of the fact that a bank can enter a number into a computer and charge it to your account effortlessly and then earn rent in the form of interest on that process, that's not understood by professional economists. It's not understood by that great economist, Paul Krugman. He thinks banks are just intermediaries between savers and borrowers. And if that's false understanding that actually underpins the power of the bankers. Now, two weeks ago, or about ten days ago, the Bank of England uh, published a really, really important report. It was their quarterly bulletin. And in it they explained that banks create money out of thin air. And they said this, and they explained the sequence. The money is created. The money for a loan does not exist, is not in the bank, until you, the borrower, apply for a loan. Only then does the bank create the money through the loan as debt for you. The sequence of events, said the Bank of England in its report, is not understood by, most, by, by many textbooks, it says. Let's be clear, it's not understood by any of the economic textbooks taught in our universities. And that's not an accident. It suits Wall Street and the banks enormously to have that kind of ignorance prevail in our universities and underpin their position where they are. So because we don't understand the nature of money, we didn't understand when in 1968 and 1970, 1971, controls and regulation and the management of money began to be loosened. We didn't even know it was happening, many of us. And we don't therefore understand that if we are to put the, the debt thing back in its box, if we are to write off debts, if we are going to manage debt, the first thing we have to do is manage the creation of money, to regulate the creation of, of money and loans, to manage and regulate the price of money, which is the rate of interest. You know, at the moment, it's left to something called the market. So the Bank of England's rate might, we have now the lowest base rates in, in history. The highest rate, bank rates in the whole of the world is something like 0.25%. But if you go out and you're a small business and you want an overdraft because you'd like to employ some people and you, you know, the, the, your, your, your client hasn't paid for your goods but you want to keep paying your wages, the bank will charge you 15, 20, 25 percent. And nobody says boom or buy. And that is the bankruptcy number. And of course, when they say that Portugal's um, yield, the yields on Portugal's bonds have fallen to 4 percent and this is radically low, it is actually very high in real terms because of deflation across the Eurozone. So we have to understand both the creation of money but also the price of money. And then above all, we have to be campaigning for controls over the mobility of capital across borders. There's no way we're going to do anything about trade. There's no way we're going to do anything about land grabs in Africa. There's no way we're going to be doing about workers' rights unless we control the mobility of capital. That is a very radical demand. There was a time when you talked about capital controls when you could more or less be excommunicated when people looked at you with disdain. And the left didn't really know what we were talking about, but certainly the right knew what we were talking about, and they, they actually marginalised, and all the people working on capital controls in the academic sphere were marginalised. <coughs> it's becoming more mainstream. Capital controls are popping up everywhere. Problem is they're gonna, they're gonna pop up in times of crisis. Russia will probably impose capital controls because oligarchs are desperately trying to get their money out of Russia. And if money was to flood out of the United States, they would be the first to impose capital controls. But often it's in, they're imposed in chaotic conditions and unmanaged badly. We need it to be a matter of policy and a matter of regulations for the mobility of capital to be controlled. So uh, none, of this, none, of, none, of, none of the control over debt or over the big finance sectors or over Wall Street or over the City of London will ever happen so long as we allow capital mobility. But I don't see people out in the street saying, 
constrain capital mobility. I want to see that. I want to see much more of that. I want to see us talking and writing about it. Because if we do that, we begin to change the balance of power between the finance sector and society. There's much more of this. My publisher says I have to tell you this. <laughs> In my e-book, which is only going for £2.99 on Amazon, but you can also get it from uh, primeeconomics.org, um, and it's called Just Money, How to um, Challenge the Despotic Power of Finance. And then finally, I'm on Twitter, at Anne Pettifor. I'd love to engage with you. I've heard most of what's happening today because I've been following what you've been doing on Twitter. So please join me there because we're going to be doing much more work through Prime Economics on this issue. Thank you very much. lots of potential for exposing and challenging illegitimate debt. And one country where um, some of the sort of greatest progress is being made using um, debt audits is Tunisia. Um, and our next speaker, Jihan Chandor, is a um, spokesperson for the um, campaign Let's Audit Tunisia's Debt, which is ASET in, in, in French. Um, ASET's a, a European Tunisian platform. And Jihan is also um, working for the Tunisian Economic Observatory. Um, and advocating for debt, le debt audit legislation in Tunisia, and she's going to tell us a bit more about that. Jihan. Everybody, I am so I'm Jihan from the platform Let's Audit Tunisian Debt. So after the revolution in 2011, we started to build this uh, platform between Tunisia and some uh, European countries to ask for a debt audit and a credit uh, audit also. Uh, we have been campaigning since uh, two years and um, we're here to, to exchange information and uh, learning about our uh, debt audit campaigns and the difficulty we faced in. So, um, in Tunisia, basically, uh, at the beginning, it was uh, very, um, I mean, positive. We had some uh, positive uh, support from uh, all the uh, political parties, the institutions, uh, the assembly, uh, Tunisian people. So, um, our campaign were, were, was based on uh, raising awareness about the debt uh, issue and uh, also advocate for a debt audit. And our main success was to, uh, co uh, to collaborate with members of the parliament to draft a, a bill to implement the commi commission to make the audit. Um, but after this positive wave, uh, just after the revolution, we faced uh, difficulties with uh, strong international uh, pressure to stop this uh, dynamic. And uh, we started to have some difficulties in Tunisia to, to, uh, to carry on our, uh, our campaign. So, um, I won't be too long, but uh, what I want to uh, tell is that I think uh, our main learning is that we all have to focus on education to, uh, to, to success and to, um, to make change happen. Uh, in Tunisia, I think for, uh, for us, the main objective now is to uh, try to understand how it works, how the debt mechanism works, um, why we are actually in this situation of poverty and the link, uh, the relationship between uh, the debt. So uh, we have to go through our history. So in this way, in, in, this, uh, in this way, we started to uh, to look after our arch archives and start to understand what happened since the colonization and after the colonization. Uh, and uh, through the debt issue, you, we, we understood lots of, um, lots of our history and why we are in this uh, current situation. So um, I think the main focus is, uh, is education and when uh, we will have many people understanding and uh, having this uh, mind revolution, we, we can uh, become actor of changes. 
That's it. Thank you. Um, and there's a really exciting network which is formed called ICANN, the International Citizens Debt Audit Network, which is actually meeting here in London over this weekend as well. Um, hopefully um, you may have met lots of people who are part, part of that network today um, who are really sort of sharing <coughs> strategies and tactics around the potential for using debt audits and, and that kind of popular education process that it enables. Um, our next speaker is Vicky Donnelly. Um, Vicky's a development <coughs> education worker um, with Gal the Galway One World Centre um, and she's a member of Debt Justice Ireland um, and an active member of the Anglo Not Our Debt campaign um, which has been um, really focused on primarily awareness raising about the wholesale transfer of private um, sort of banking debt onto public shoulders in Ireland. Vicky. Hi, I'm just standing here because we had pictures and I didn't want to, to let them go to waste. Um, our biggest challenge, I think I mentioned it in the earlier session, but our biggest challenge in the debt justice movement in Ireland is to interrupt and puncture the narrative coming from government, coming from the Troika and coming from the media that we are a success story rather than a crime scene. Um, that we are poster boys and girls for austerity, that we are you know, exiting the bailout, that we, are, that we should take pride in punching above our weight in Europe as a, as a tiny country. Um, that we're turning corners so often that we feel like we've arrived back where we started. <laughs> and the gap between this rhetoric of recovery and the reality of our lives I think actually makes us dizzy because at just one, about 1% 1 of Europe's population we are paying over 40% of the cost of the banking crisis. So we are literally on our knees, we're telling, being told that this is a, an elevated position. <laughs> so our Taoiseach, our, our Prime Minister, Enda Kenny, tells us that people on the streets are telling him all the time, actually, how happy they are with the situation and the progress that we're making. And the Troika similarly takes their legitimacy from conversations that they have with taxi drivers, apparently, that inform them of you know, the wonderful progress they're making. And meanwhile, we berate ourselves by saying that we don't do anything, that in Ireland we don't protest. And why is that? Why, where are the mass movements like on the streets of Madrid? You know, why aren't there people out burning cars? The Greeks apparently, I'd love to know if this is true, if there are any comrades from, Greeks, from Greece, apparently were heard chanting in 2010 on the streets of Athens, we are not Ireland, we will resist. <laughs> <laughs> not funny. <laughs> Dave Lorden puts it like this, he says, first, we have to learn how to live in this occupied space. And so the beginning of the debt justice movement, it has been small and it has been quite sort of confined to people who perhaps are already interested in um, challenging illegitimate debt in the global south and learning from the struggles of our comrades there. But I suspect that, it's, that that's changing. The last taxi I got into, this late 50s Dublin man looked, looked up from his copy of The Shock Doctrine and asked me where I wanted to go. <laughs> so I think our rage is awakening. So what I wanted to do briefly was just to share some of those. It's much for our own pride and to sort of contradict the notion that we don't do anything, but to share some of the ways in which we've mobilised. And when I say we, I suppose I'm talking mostly from the Anglo Not Our Debt campaign, which is a, a network of community groups, of development groups, faith-based groups, of union involvement, and, and academics. But there are also other incredible things happening in tiny communities, like the tiny, not even town, the village of Ballyhay in County Cork, where people went from deciding that they would march every day on Sunday after Mass, to now having meetings with you know, the head of the, the Econ Committee, or the head of the Central Bank, and demanding debt right down. So citizens are mobilising. Um, I'll come back to a couple of these. Young people mobilising with the, with the promise that we are not leaving you know, in the face of mass emigration and mass unemployment. Um, some people are taking very direct action, like the person who drove a concrete mixer into the, uh, into the parliament. Um, but mostly in terms of focusing on this so-called promissory note deal that covered uh, over 30 billion euros of debt for one zombie bank that was under criminal investigation when the government wrote this giant IOU for it. We're obviously working with the media and doing all those kind of usual campaign things. We're on the streets, we're marching. Solidarity actions from, like from the Jubilee campaign in England were enormously meaningful to us in terms of raising the profile of the campaign. We petition, although we're becoming more keen on phone calls now, getting the phone numbers of the people that we want to petition, because at least then you're tying up their time. <laughs> 
Um, we have public meetings and talks. You know, sort of community education being very, very important. We try to brief TDs and journalists when they're interested and when they can understand the big numbers. Um, we're engaging very strongly with community groups, and that is showing itself on the streets in terms of parades with beautiful term, uh, titles like Spectacle of Defiance and Hope. And some images that come from that just show the kind of the level of, of, of um, just the richness of protest that is actually alive in Ireland. We hold a lot of creative actions, trying to find ways to kind of grab people's attention um, on the streets or in front of AGMs, um, tying in with events that are happening in the wider death justice movement. Um, I don't know to, what they're called, memes or memes. <laughs> but they're good too. Um, the, where I live in Galway, the West Coast, a very uh, famous city of the arts, so we've held meetings of artists, for artists, to see how they could also engage. Um, we've held community picnics, um, with giant postcards being sent to the Troika when they're here for their inspection visit, saying, wish you weren't here. Um, we've tied it in with pretty much everything that we can think of, public events like the St. Patrick's Day Parade, which is, you know, despite the fact that it rains every single time, is at a moment of sort of public celebration of Irishness, and it's commemorating this dubious historical notion that somebody drove the snakes out of Ireland. So we had a, a parade where he also drove the zombie bankers out. Um, and here, as I say, the Ballyhay Charleville people. There's, there's lots of like, I have to say, the, they went from their tiny village to the ECB, right to the gates of the ECB, where they handed in the first demand for debt write down. It did not come from the government, actually still has not come from the state. The so citizens were the first ones to demand that. How am I for time? Oh, okay. Um, in trying to, I think as Anne was talking about, our, 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 our very deliberate confusion about what money is and where it comes from, the government was able to create, through the central bank, was able to create over 30 billion euros to pay this failed zombie bank. So we created our own coin as well. We had a coin launched to coincide with the central bank's issuing of a new coin. We created a 3.1 billion euro coin. <laughs> and offered to them in payment for our, our commissary note, um, our, our allegedly our debt that was up, coming up. And so in, in doing creative actions like that, trying to generate some kind of debate, not just about the debt that's in front of us, but how that debt came into being in the first place. Um, the economists that very kindly brief us and guide us kept saying in very sort of dour terms that actually Ireland probably has one of the most expensive bank bailouts in the world. And that sort of was very demoralising until we thought, well, perhaps actually we could, you know, claim the credit for that. And we um, launched an application with the Guinness Book of Records to, to claim our right to place, because we are, as, a, as, um, as we're reminded, we are punching above our weight. Now, we've just been turned down in 2013, but we've got because apparently, it, like they have a category for it, apparently we have to claim per taxpayer and not just per citizen. So, <laughs> unless you've got your eyes on that record next year, we're, we're going to be back in there. <laughs> so, finally, our, 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 our um, up and coming actions we're looking at holding a People's Tribunal in, in October. We're toying with ideas, perhaps, of using that as a, a way to, in, in conjunction with them. Um, with legal scholars to maybe practice and rehearse ways of accessing legal mechanisms to challenge the legitimacy, the illegitimacy of the debt. In the meantime, those bonds from Anglo are sitting in the Irish Central Bank and just awaiting sale into the markets, which is really bad news for us. So our plan is to um, target the chair of the, uh, the the head of the Irish Central Bank. This is his number, just in case you're interested in giving him a ring. <laughs> and to express your disquiet about it, um, and we would love, we would love to have that support and to share and offer our support to your campaigns as well. But I'm pretty sure that's eight minutes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is also someone who's been really involved in, um, I guess, trying to evolve the tactics around um, challenging what, in his words, I think um, he described as the battle line of consent, which I think is, is um, a really good way of thinking about it, the battle line of consent about unjust and, and illegitimate debt. He's a um, professor of social and cultural studies at New York University um, and an activist with um, the Stripe Debt Movement and Rolling Jubilee Movement in the States. Um, and he's also author of a fantastic recently published book called Creditocracy um, and another book called The Case for Debt Refusal. Um, that's Andrew Ross. They're actually the same book. 
Maybe they should be two oh, different sorry. books. <laughs> I said that three times today, sorry. <laughs> Um, so uh, thank you. Uh, un unlike um, unlike some some of my fellow panelists and many folks in the audience, I'm relatively new to the Dutchers movement. <coughs> only about two and a half years uh, active in in the movement, and so uh, I'm not quite burned out yet. Um, and uh, and burnout, uh, periodic burnout, is is obviously something that all activists undergo, and it doesn't go without saying. And that's why. Occasions like this are so important for all of us to recharge our batteries, get back in our horses, or whatever metaphor is appropriate. Um, so I, uh, I came into the movement really through Occupy Wall Street just two and a half years ago, and most of my work's been uh, focused on personal debt, household debt, uh, unlike many folks in the room whose work's been focused on sovereign debts. And I also came in personally motivated by being a university teacher because I just couldn't go on walking into my classrooms uh, where uh, the proverbial elephant in the room was this massive uh, debt burden um, about which my students could not or would not speak for all sorts of reasons. And that motivated me to find out why they could not and would not speak about their debts. Um, so that led to, uh, I helped to find the Occupy Student Debt Campaign uh, in the fall of 2011, and that was a national campaign of debt refusal. It was a very audacious effort to, uh, to mount a mass debt strike of a million student debtors. Um, and uh, the, cut a long story short, we got nowhere near uh, the, the numbers that we'd aimed for. Uh, the time was not right for, uh, for launching a mass debtors strike like that. Um, and we learned a lot of lessons in the course of the campaign. Uh, we also did a lot of good work, however, we thought. We raised the profile of the student debt crisis. We learned a lot about the psychology of student debtors, which is a very important thing if you're operating and organizing on the, on, on the landscape of personal debt. You have to know a lot about the psychology of the debtor. Um, and also, we pushed the concept of debt refusal into the public sphere in the U.S., where it had not been before. By the end of the campaign, we realized that focusing on student debt alone was kind of artificial. Because if you look at any one household, there's many, there are many, many debts that flow through the household and they're interdependent. So we formed the Strike Debt Coalition in the summer of 2012 in order to focus on the interdependence of all of the household debts. We did two, um, two large-scale uh, uh, collective projects. Uh, I'll say briefly, say something briefly about each of them. Uh, they were conceived as projects of public education. The first one was the Debt Resistors Operations Manual. Uh, I brought along a sample copy of the second edition. It's been out there in, on, on the book desk uh, all day. Um, it was collectively produced um, as a, a user guide uh, for people uh, who, who really wanted some, some basic tools in how to either renegotiate uh, uh, their debts or, or evict the power of creditors from their lives in small ways, but also to raise a level of consciousness about how individual acts uh, were, were all well and good, but they weren't going to change the system, and we needed to move towards collective action and collective organizing to change the debt money system. So the, the second edition is, is now available, it's coming out very soon. You can, or you, can, you can either buy it or you can download it from the strikedebt.org website for free. Second project was the Rolling Jubilee project. And that was an effort to, uh, to raise money to buy distressed debt on the secondary debt marketplace and abolish it. It sold very, very cheaply. Um, and um, we raised a lot of money, uh, about $750,000 over the course of several months. And to date, we have abolished about $14 million worth of debt, mostly medical debt. Uh, we closed the fund recently because it wasn't, uh, wasn't conceived as a long-term project. It's mostly, as I said, a project of public education, uh, exposing how the, the shadowy and mur murky marketplace of uh, um, of secondary that operates. And uh, the goal really was to, to put it into people's minds, people who are being pursued by debt collectors who bought their debts for a mere pittance and are calling you up to extract the full amount 
to put it into people's minds that this is a, a, a very unfair situation. And with that knowledge in mind, the debtor has a different kind of conversation with the debt collector on the telephone, uh, knowing how little they've paid for their debts. Um, so that was a, a strike against the debt system, and strike that was conceived as a, a, a coalition that would produce, whatever we did would be conceived of as a strike against the debt system, no matter how small. So rather than moving towards a mass debt strike, uh, with that kind of goal in mind, we decided that everything we would do, and this is very important when you're organizing, because you have to feel you're winning uh, on a daily basis with small acts, uh, and, and, and they can be the smallest kind of act, but as long as you perceive of them as acts of resistance, then you're constantly, you feel the sense of momentum. Um, so uh, we closed the fund um, in December of last year, just a few months ago. We still have a, a, quite a lot of money still to spend, but we closed the fund because we wanted to, um, to devote our time and energy to trying to build some kind of debtors' union uh, that would be capable of, uh, of launching something larger. It's very difficult to organize around debt, especially household debts. That's one of the things we've learned. It's not like organizing around wages, which isn't exactly easy either. Uh, but organizing around debt is particularly difficult. And so um, we're talking to a lot of technologists right now about how to build a platform that will uh, facilitate the task of finding groups of debtors who are, uh, who are right um, uh, for, for debt strikes of one sort or another, who are either on the verge of default uh, or who, um, who can mobilize themselves to pursue collective action. Um, the last thing I'll say really is that, uh, and for those of you who like neat historical distinctions, uh, here, here is one. Um, I think we, we could probably be agreed that during the industrial era, strife over wages was a primary uh, form of conflict. And in our times, it's pretty clear that the struggle over debt is shaping up to be the, the primary conflict of our times. Not because wage conflict is over, uh, it never will be, but because debts for most people are quite literally the wages of the future. That's what happens when you take on debts, you're promising your future wages. And so, um, and, and those are wages of the future to which creditors lay claim far in advance. And that's why I think of a lot of debts, especially household debts, as a premature form of wage theft, which is particularly immoral. Mm -hmm. And why I think that each new surrender of our, a part of our lives to personal debt financing further consumes the fruits of labor in the future that we have not yet performed in the form of compensation that we have not yet earned. And so in that regard, I think building a debtor's movement around household debts at least is a natural extension of the labor movement in many ways. And perhaps it will require a, a level of organizing at least as momentous as the labor movement did in its heyday. Thank you. Um, is another veteran and, and key figure in the um, in the, the global um, debt movement. Um, and Jackie Jehu was um, very active in the in the Jubilee South movement, um, which was so successful in cancelling a lot of the debt that built up in developing countries in the 1980s and 1990s. And she is still very active now on debt, but also on wider issues of economic injustice. She's the founder and executive director of the Daughters of Mumbi, which is a Nairobi-based organization working on food sovereignty and gender rights. Um, and she's also been on a, a session, a panel on every session today. So um, <laughs> please send her lots of energy in your applause. Please welcome Jokey. Thank you, she is very tired. Um, I think that we've had a very full day and I've talked a lot. I think I'm totally out of words to say. Um, and I thought that what I would do um, in this question of what do we do, how do we change the world, those meta questions that uh, really uh, we must keep asking because 
um, the world does need changing. I felt that I would pay tribute um, to the late Professor Angari Madai um, and share the hummingbird story, which people may or may not know. Um, do you know the hummingbird story? Uh, okay, good. Um, this <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing like a fresh audience when you're <laughs> saying uh, a lot of things. But this is a story that um, Professor Angari Madai, uh, the late Professor Angari Madai, the 2004 Nobel Peace Laureate, um, founder of the Green Belt Movement, um, used to tell about doing what any of us, uh, doing activism, whatever the activism is, and she said that she heard the story in um, in Japan. It actually sounds more like an African story, but she heard the story in Japan. And the story is that the forest was on fire, and as you can imagine, there was a great big panic in the forest with all the animals and the birds trying to get away uh, from this raging forest. Um, and they got off to... Um, a safe distance and they were all, all watching, terrified, paralyzed and not knowing what to do as their home um, or their homes were consumed by the fire. And uh, in all of this was this little hummingbird. We all know how tiny a hummingbird is. And the hummingbird was flying from the river, getting a drop of water and putting it on the fire flying back as fast as it could and getting another drop and putting it on the fire back and forth and all these other animals were watching and they say what do you think you're doing you're too little the fire is too big and you really can't make a difference and of course as you can imagine peer pressure in the forest even when it's on fire I'm sure alive and well and so um, they were ridiculing and saying, you can't make a difference, you know, just give up. And the hummingbird, who was not daunted, said, I'm doing the best that I can. I'm doing the best that I can. If you imagine, if the elephant had gotten into this and did the best that he or she could do, if maybe a hippo which could in its wide mouth take a lot of water, had taken a gulp and tried to put out the fire, it would have made the difference and perhaps even put out the fire. And so for all of us, the challenges, the issues, the struggles that we face are quite daunting. But all we are asked to do is to do the best that each of us can. And if enough of us are doing the best that we can, I think we can win and we do win and we shall win. Thank you. And those of you who are here this morning um, would have heard the beautiful um, document's poem statement that Adina, Adina Azadeh read, uh, read out about her Berlin Books project. She's just going to give a bit of an update on what the project is doing next. Thank you for everyone who's written in this book already and um, those who will send their entries in um, in the coming days and weeks, um, burningthebooks.co.uk. Um, and this book will, this particular volume book will be burned on the 22nd of May in Brighton. Um, then we're going to Lewis and then we're going to be going to Brixton um, in September and uh, further dates to be announced. So um, please, um, yeah, please stay in touch and would love to gather as many entries from people who've been here today because it's such a specialised environment and normally when I go out with this book people don't want to talk about debt and they're really quite frightened and intimidated and then when I start to speak they, 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 they slowly come around. So it's been great to speak to an audience who were already you know, thinking and very deeply about the issues that have been raised. I just wanted to quickly read one entry which came in, which I was really moved by, to finish with. Is that OK? It says, Every one of us, as unique and intact members of humanity, enters this world owing nothing to anyone. 
It's only then, from that very first moment of human life, that the world we've constructed historically decides any one of us can be a debtor. Just as each and every one of our lives was a gift, we can only honour that gift by giving to others. We are nothing of ourselves. Only when we share the magnificent gifts of our living experience do we then become truly rich together, every one of us, bar none. beautiful um, note on which for us to wrap up the conference um, and that that is nearly it we really hope that Jubilee Debt campaign that you found today useful we're really committed to helping to build the movement to challenge um, unjust and illegitimate debt and we really hope that you'll stay connected with us um, you can find out more about us on our website it's www.jubileedebt.org.uk but we also really hope that you've made lots of connections with other people, other activists, other networks all the amazing organisations and groups who are doing fantastic work on this today as well um, there's um, lots of people who've been involved in making this conference happen um, but there's two people who've been particularly crucial um, Hannah Schling who sat over there in the corner joined us temporarily and did a lot of the initial thinking and, and organising for this day and Jonathan who's probably not in here is he? Um, is yeah, Jonathan Jonathan Stevenson um, has uh, pulled lots of late nights and early mornings um, pulling off uh, the day and all, everything around here. So, um, and then also we need to say a massive thanks to everyone who's spoken on platforms. Lots of people have spoken on more than one platform. Some of the people have done about five. Um, and people have come from um, across the UK, from Europe and, and obviously from um, around the world as well. Um, including our fantastic panel. So please um, join me in, in thanking them. And <laughs>